Hi, I got an email from a BM235 customer who's had it for uh, quite a few years, but it um, started to give a problem where even if it was uh, switched off like this, it would drain the batteries. And uh, he linked me to an EV blogger forum thread from uh, 2018 where another customer had exactly the same um, issue. Now, I don't ever recall seeing that uh, thread because there's like over 800 posts a day on the EV blog forum. There's a lot. Um, and I didn't reply to it, so I'm not sure if they uh, contacted me direct or or what. But anyway, this is the first time I've heard about uh, battery drain when it's off like this. Of course, uh, it's got uh, power saving mode after, you know, X amount of minutes. Uh, if you leave it on and you do nothing with it, it'll auto uh, switch off, auto power off uh, function. And then, of course, the microprocessor in it will uh, take some residual uh, power and it's waiting for a button uh, to, you know, wake up and stuff like that. But in the off position, of course, um, it should have physically disconnected the switch, but um, I don't have a schematic uh, for this because Bryman refused to release schematics even to um, trusted dealers like myself. So uh, yeah, you know, it's all secret squirrel and everything. So uh, let's open this up and have a look inside because I don't remember um, the architecture of the switch and the battery and um, any other devices in there that may actually cause a drain. Um, so yeah, there must be something else in there like a protection device before the switch or something else uh, before the switch that is chewing um, some residual power. So let's crack it open. All right, so first of all, let's actually measure um, the residual current of this in the off position. We can do that with the BM786 here because it's got 10 nanoamps resolution here. Uh, we don't have to go get in like uh, the microcurrent or something like that to get anything lower because like a really low power uh, device will take in the order of like microamps, like a standby thing, like a really ultra low power device, uh, ultra low power micro might operate at like hundreds of nanoamps or something like that. If you get down into like the 10 nanoamp uh, region, then you're like really ultra, 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 ultra low power. So, and have a squeeze. Let's up, oh, get it the right way around. And there we go. There we go. <laughs> I saw something. We're down in the least significant digit there, but I didn't see any jump up there. So obviously there's no capacitance on the input that's like charging up or anything. So. Yeah, there's just absolutely nothing there. And if you're wondering about the operational current in voltage mode, there you go, two odd milliamps. And I won't bother getting the uh, standby uh, consumption. This thing, I have to wait till it turns off and then you can't break the thing. You've got to have it permanently wired in. And in any case, the report is um, that it does it in the off position. So let's crack it open. So my first and best guess to the customer was that, oh, maybe there's like a reverse bias uh, diode protection in there. So uh, to basically um, short out the batteries or actually, you know, limit them to 0.6 volts if you actually uh, put the batteries in backwards. And if you've got a diode um, that does that, then of course diodes will have leakage. And if it's using like a one in 4001, something like that, uh, absolute classic for that um, application, then they're not low leakage, um, of course. So, you know, they might take microamps, but they certainly shouldn't take, uh, you know, you, to drain these batteries uh, within weeks that he's talking about or something, um, then you're going to need like um, in the order of like, uh, you know, hundreds of microamps or milliamps. So here we go inside and we've got uh, spring contacts here for the batteries and they contact these two points down here. Bingo, I think right off the bat, as I suspected, between those two contacts, Bingo, a power diode that's likely like a 1N4001 or something like that. And there you go, I was right on the money. It's a 1N4007. The 4007 is the highest voltage uh, part in that range. The reason they're not using a 4001 is because they probably use it uh, for protection somewhere else and they're uh yeah just reusing that bomb part now, from a bill of materials point of view it doesn't uh you know make any sense to have you know high voltage uh, parts somewhere else and then the 4001 lower voltage one across the uh, battery you just they're so uh cheap and yeah you wouldn't bother having a different uh bill of materials item just to put across the battery of course uh, the battery only needs uh low voltage so the 4001 would uh, work a treat but anyway now i had to go through a couple 
couple of dozen data sheets because uh, Murphy says it wouldn't be the first one I opened before I could find one with a reverse characteristic uh, graph like this that actually has the reverse uh, current in microamps uh, versus the uh, voltage, the reverse voltage on here. And um, yeah, I found this one. This is a uh, Fairchild jobby. This is for the uh, through hole uh, part, but it should be identical uh, for the surface mount variety anyway and they'll slightly vary between manufacturers but basically all 1N4001 4007s are pretty much equivalent. So if you don't have one of these graphs, then the only thing you've got to go by is basically the, uh, the spec table, which is going to give you uh, the worst case uh, reverse current at the maximum rated voltage. And of course, we're not operating at the maximum rated voltage and or the maximum rated temperature as well. You can see they've got three different characteristic uh, curves at different temperatures. We're at ambient uh, uh, temperature here. And we're only operating this thing at basically um, three volts here because we've got two AA batteries, three volts tops. So this is 10 volts and we're already down at 20 nanoamps. Look, it, it just drops off a cliff here. Like it, it's 10 nanoamps down here at five volts, you know, roughly less than that. This is why we weren't able to measure anything on our BM786. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that this isn't the culprit. You could very well have a, you know, a faulty diode in there that has excess uh, leakage. So if you've got this sort of problem, it can be in any multimeter. This is uh, very common. Any product, actually, um, that has batteries, uh, you might typically have a, like a reverse bias diode like this. If you can afford the luxury of the voltage drop, then you put the diode in series with the uh, batteries, but then you get your 0.6 volt uh, drop. And on a three volt battery, eh, that's pretty crippling. So you have your reverse uh, bias diodes. There's other ways to protect, but anyway, this is cheap and simple. And um, yeah, it could certainly have come a guts of that part. So if you have see this sort of thing in the product, excess power consumption, um, I would potentially look at that. And as I said, like you should be able to measure that with an ordinary multimeter. You shouldn't need a microcurrent or any other fancy six and a half digit meter or something like that uh, to try and measure the low current. If it's like in the order of microamps, eh, you don't have to worry about it. If you've got significant battery drain, it's going to be in the order of like, you know, hundreds of microamps kind of thing. Or more. Now, of course, the other thing you might want to look at is any uh, potential contamination around here. You might have, uh, you know, have moisture on the board. You might have, you might have spilled something, some liquid in through the battery uh, compartment or something like that. So I'd give it a big, cl a good clean with um, some isopropyl uh, alcohol, and then you know, just give it a good dry out and uh, see if that makes a difference. But um, yeah, I don't have the customer. This is not the customer's unit, so I don't know. Now, that diode might not be the only thing that's in parallel with the battery. So let's have a close look at the PCB here, shall we? I've got my original teardown photos, which are included in the manual. I claim it to be the only multimeter in manual in the world with photos of the PCB in it. So what I've got is the top and bottom of the PCB here. And as you've seen in previous uh, reverse engineering videos, I've actually uh, taken these photos and I've skew corrected them. I've rotated them. So they're roughly the same. They're not absolutely perfect. But if you focus on, say, the center of this pin uh, down here, if you can see my uh, cursor, then, you know, it does a reasonably good job of aligning these up. So I've rotated them, flipped them and cropped them. So they're pretty much uh, line up good enough so that we can actually flip from top side to bottom side of the board and trace uh, things like this. Now, unfortunately, I just realized um, that these photos, these would have come from my when I first um, got this uh, meter. So I don't know what the revision is. I think it might, is it chopped off? I don't know. Anyway, this would have been one of the original units. And you'll notice up here, where's the diode? Where's Wally? Um, it's not there. Where you saw it, it was actually wedged. It it was actually put well. My um yeah, Earth and View skills aren't that good. But yeah, they've actually squeezed this on um future models. I don't know how many years this. I can't remember. Um, they might have mentioned this change way way back. I've been selling this meter for like six plus years at least. I think something like that. So yeah. Anyway, the new meters um in quote marks have the diode in there but apart from that i can't really see any other differences i am you know uh, using the mark one eyeball at the moment i'll have to get like some new uh photos of this and uh put them up there on my ev blog Flickr account which is where i put all my high-res uh, photos for stuff but yeah it looks identical apart from adding 
the diode. Everything up there else looks the same. So yeah, she'll be right. So yeah, just imagine there's a diode in there, okay? So this here is our positive terminal. Where else does it go? Well, there's this giant uh, via here, like a test hole, but it's, you know, it's actually connected, so it goes down as well. And there's two little uh, piddly vias there, and they go down to the bottom side. And you can see, there they are, okay? So a trace buggers off this way like this, goes up here, we'll follow the money there, and these come down and this goes across here, please forgive my crude mouse skills, and this goes off here. Let's just trace this one here first, okay? So if we flip to the bottom layer, there it is, follow the money. Just follow the money. And we're following, following, following there, and boom. There it is. That's what I expected. It went through to the switch contact in there like that. So the battery is like switched. So at the moment, the diode is still the only thing that's directly connected across the battery. But aha, what about this one up here? You're saying, well, let's follow the money there. Trust in Deep Throat, follow the money. He knows what he's talking about. Anyway, that goes under there. I'm pretty sure there's nothing else under there. That goes along here and boom, goes to these two vias down here. Let's switch, there they are there. And this goes around here. Interestingly, they do have the uh, solder mask removed from that. Not entirely sure why. Anyway, it goes to a big hole over here and that pops up on this side. And we might have to actually do some zoomy zoom on that. There you go. It doesn't connect to that, but aha, uh -huh, bingo, goes off to actually two capacitors, C24 and C26 there. So we've got a diode and two capacitors in parallel with uh, the battery, even though the switch is off. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so where do these go? Well, um, this goes via an inductor here, which is basically just a short circuit, and then it goes over to uh, the current shunt here, which then goes up to here, and that would be, that's our ground, I believe, that's our ground um, terminal, because our fuse comes in over here, like this, goes through our high rupture capacity HRC fuse here, goes through the uh, 10 amp current jack like that, so this here would be ground, and you can tell because they're uh, basically doing some star splitting off here, and then that buggers off over here, so this is uh, ground over here, then you've got star grounding over here as well, so that it's a common point, I mentioned star grounding uh, technique in other uh, ones, and then there's another inductor there, and then once more, got some star grounding going off here, they love their star grounding, don't they? And they're actually doing the same thing over here, so why do they have um, these capacitors across here, like this, across the battery? What's what's the point? Well, I don't actually um, know. I can only presume it's for some, uh, you know, EMI compliance thing. But why would you care if it's switched off? I don't know why. I don't know. If you've got any idea, leave it in the comments down below. But if the thing's switched off, I can understand having the reverse bias diode across there. It's to protect it when you uh, plug them in. But even that, you can have on the other side of the switch, really. So, yeah, I I don't know the reason why they've got those um, caps in there. I can only presume some sort of EMI compliance thing that they had problems with. Eh. And they've got both of those capacitor there through this inductor to ground, and they've also got this capacitor through um, L3 inductor to ground as well. So, like, why they've got two of them? Sure, this one branches off uh, somewhere else, okay? They, they're taking that uh, reference point, that ground reference point off via that inductor there, but these inductors, uh, these are just like little, very low value, like RFIB kind of thing. So, you know, it might have some, not only compliance issues, but they might uh, be to help um, RFI interference being picked up by the test leads going into the measurement circuitry and stuff like that. But still, why you need them? before the switch. That's what I'm asking. I don't understand that at all. Anyway, if either of these capacitors here develops any sort of leakage um, at all, then that leakage is directly across the battery um, from the ground. And I'm sure that this ground point is going to go back to the battery. 
here's the ground point here. We'd have to actually uh, follow the money all the way. And look, here's these uh, star groundings again. Look at this. They're a real <laughs> star grounding fanboy, aren't they? Just all these different paths just um, snaking off here. Absolutely incredible. They've got it up here again. Look at this. Like three different star uh, ground. They, that might be not be ground. It might be another uh, uh, voltage potential. But yeah, these are just like, and there's another three going off there. And there's probably like a bunch more within the meter so they're really um you know star um reference point star grounding uh fanboys which is great design practice um of course so here i was just editing the video and i thought no, no i should measure that because it's not going to be connected um yes the actual uh battery ground here is a, in a lot of multimeter designs most um yeah it won't be connected to the actual uh ground physical ground input here it's not uh floating though i actually measured it uh with the meter and it's 3k ohms in one direction and 33k in the other so like there's active you know stuff in there but yeah basically um if these caps but once again if these caps were actually uh leaking then there yes that would actually leak back to the negative terminal so all that stuff is still valid but yeah anyway we've got a diode and two capacitors across there like that i can't see anything else that is across the battery so to the customer who's got a uh, couple of year old um faulty bm uh 235 yeah i'd be looking at those three components in fact you could remove them and the meter would still work um function and meet spec and everything else it just won't be um as maybe rfie protected um, and also uh, reverse battery uh, protection. You're essentially removing that. I don't know what happened if you were putting the batteries back to front. Um, just don't do that. But anyway, you could put new ones in there. So I would say it's most likely, come on, your money has to be on these MLCC, multi-layer ceramic uh, capacitors there. You know, not the greatest things at the best of time and maybe, you know, get some board flex in here. In fact, the meter actually did have um, a video a long time ago. I have to link it in. Actually, in this area, there were actually um, board flex issues and we were getting, what, breaking in the inductors, weren't we? Or something, the board was flex. I can't remember the exact thing. I'll link in the video. But uh, yeah, that was happening around there. That's not related to this uh, battery um, issue because even if, if these inductors uh, break, of course, then, well, your grounding's completely ruined or your measurements will be completely um, off. That's got nothing to do with the battery consumption. So as I said, if you've got any clue why they uh, would put capacitors on the bat on the, like, the battery side instead of, like, after the switch, I like... This is not like it's got to uh, perform or meet any EMI requirements when it's off. So I like, yeah, why wouldn't you have those after the switch? Maybe it was just like a uh, convenient routing, something like that. And uh, maybe, uh, you know, this is not uncommon, by the way. The uh, PCB layout uh, asked me how I know the circuit designer designed the meter and then they threw it over, you know, <laughs> threw it over the cubicle wall to the PCB layout design engineer. And they went, oh, look, I can't just like it's on the other side of the board. I can't put these things here and get it back here. And like all that um, sort of jazz, like, really, you want me to? Can't I just put it before the switch? And they asked the designer, the designer goes, yeah, whatever, it'll still do the same thing, you know, if that helps in your layout or something like that, um, which you might have to do often in actual design. You might have to actually compromise um, your PCB layout. Uh, sw pin swapping is another uh, thing, right? If you've got your microcontroller pins, your FPGA pins or something like that, and your routing's not, you know, you just can't, your last trace, it can't go in there. Well, you might swap some of your microcontroller or your FPGA uh, pins or something like that um, just to ease your uh, routing. You know, basically, it's it's got to come back to here, so, you know, it's it's not a stretch to kind of get it back to there, but then you'd have to come in through the switch and stuff like that. So, yeah, I yeah, no, I don't know. So there you go. I hope you liked that video and found it useful. If you did, give it a big a thumbs up. And if you've um, seen other multimeters that have stuff on the like battery side of the um, power switch, then please leave it in the comments down below i know everyone in the ev log uh, test equipment uh forum largest test equipment forum on the interwebs by the way um yeah they'll know <laughs> so they always know but yeah that's interesting i thought it would have been only a reverse 
biased diet in there. That was my guess, but no, I, I reckon there's, there's good money on those as well. I think they're much more likely than the uh, poor old diety up here, because these, you know, these one in four double oh sevens usually pretty grunty. So anyway, there you go. Catch you next time. Hello.